Welcome to another show of Celebrate Life. My name is Gary DeCarlos, and I'm your host for today. The uh, inspiration for this show came after me reading countless obituaries and saying to myself, gosh, I wish I would have gotten to know that person. What an amazing life they led. I'm a true believer that everyone has a story to tell. And, um, and so here we are, and we're, we're telling wonderful stories about wonderful people. If you have any interest in being on this show, um, feel free to give me a shout out on, at my email, which is celebratelife0747 at gmail.com. Or if you have a question for today's guest, um, feel free again to give me a, an email and I'll be glad to get it to Susie, who's our guest today, and we'll uh, get you an answer. I am honored today to have as our guest, Susie Walker. Susie has been a pioneer in the recovery world for those who are in recovery from a substance or alcohol use disorder. Welcome, Susie. Thank you, Gary. It's fun to know, be here. Thanks for oh, asking me. <laughs> it's great to have you here. And I know you've had quite a week um, at the culmination of your wonderful career as an executive director of the uh, Turning Point of Wyndham County. Mm -hmm. Oh, glad to have you here. So, <clears throat> so yes, you're you're finishing this chunk of your life, this important chunk of your life. But mm -hmm. there's a lot that went into your life to get you to this point. So, if you would take us back and tell us about that wonderful life that brought you to where you are today. Sure. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I guess just start at the beginning. I um, I grew up in a, in a dairy farm in Central New York. And it was, uh, it was a really fun way to grow up, to just be able to romp around outdoors and um, winter times sledding out behind the farm on these huge hills were just amazing. Mm. We used to, we used to, the snow would collect and make these little cliffs and we would walk across the cliff to see how far we could walk before we would fall through and go sliding <laughs> all the way to the bottom. That was fun. Um, That's fun. <laughs> so we played outside a lot. And um, who's the who's the we? We're, these are friends well, or, or family? Yeah, um, my family is uh, my mom and dad, and I had one brother and one sister, and okay. so we lived out in the country, obviously, and so we we did a lot of things together and mm. with some neighbor kids too. But um, yeah, I enjoyed being on the farm and being outdoors, and. Uh, being around the animals, although I was a little afraid of the bigger ones for some reason. Who would be afraid of a cow? <laughs> but I was. <laughs> um, so yeah, so life was uh, life was pretty sweet. I I, um, um, I love to play outdoors. I was a voracious reader. My whole family was, and so that's mm. something we shared among ourselves. And when I was little, um, I like to uh, play act and write things. And hmm. so um, I was always kind of building things or writing things or making things. Hmm. And uh, when you, you had sent me some questions to think about ahead of time and I was thinking, um, I used to love to play detective. And so I would just get my little kit together which was probably my lunchbox and a little notebook and, and a pen or whatever and it just kind of, lurk around and watch what people were doing and I'd go up in the haymow and look down out the out the uh, window oh. and then watch what was going on make copious notes about what people were doing for what purpose I don't know but <laughs> that's great I read lots of detective books and like to do that so um yeah so that was that was a really fun did you read really Nancy fun. Drew books I read yeah I read all of the whatever was yeah. popular at the time and floating yeah. around among my friends yeah uh -huh. yeah so uh yeah we uh, moved to the farm uh we had lived in one house and then we moved to the farm when I was about five and it was a lot of fun but it was also kind of a time of turmoil too um because uh, uh I grew up in an alcoholic um household and that's how I mm -hmm. found my way Eventually, I call myself an accidental nonprofit director because I just sort of, I try to be open to what life presents to me. And mm -hmm. that's just kind of how it unfolded over time. But um, 
a lot of the time that I did spend reading and playing and inventing things was my way of creating a world that was a little, uh, that made a little more sense to me, I guess, yeah. than some well, of what was going on with the grown-ups. Sure. A little sanctuary yeah. in the midst of yeah. all of that. Yeah. Yeah. It was a loving mm -hmm. home, but a little chaotic. Yes. And yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. And we had uh, farm hands that lived with us for a while. And so once they didn't do that anymore, things got a little um, more whatever normal is. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, yeah. So that's why I read a lot and uh, learned to sew and build things and write things. So that's always kind of part of me is I'm trying to make, uh, you know, take all these things that I see around me and, and make something um, fun or beautiful or useful out of them. You have a creative streak in you for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, so I grew up and um, I, uh, let's see. Yeah, our, yeah. we loved, uh, we lived on a farm and we had a big old yard. And so we would be the host for like reunions and barbecues and things like that. So mm -hmm. um, my dad loved to play host. And so there was always mm -hmm. a lot of, um, yeah, a lot of activity around that was really fun. But um, what I got to see over time was that uh, the celebrating got to be a little too much. Mm -hmm. And I started to see as a child, I started to see that the people I knew and loved were becoming strangers in front of me throughout the course of the day. Mm. And so that scared me and I, I started to retreat in different ways. Um, and then over time, I, I did see the impact of, of alcohol long before I, I found this different career in that uh, friends started to fall away and the, uh, the vibe was a little bit different. Mm. And what I started to do, and I don't know, maybe 12 or 13, I heard the word alcoholic for the first time applied to my dad and it terrified mm. me. And I didn't know really what it meant but I, in lots of little ways, I started running away from home. And what mm. that meant for me is I got super involved in things at school. I became a little overachiever. I joined a 4-H group um, and my leader there was like a second mom to me. Mm. And um, yeah, so I, I just joined activities at school and I just kind of did that kind of thing. I was an exchange student in my junior year, I guess. And then when it came time to go to college, I left New York State. It was like I bolted. I We're just bolted for Texas. And um, that was kind of the culmination of me running away in all kinds of little ways is that yep. I just said, I am out of here. You people yep. don't know what you're doing. And I'm in charge of me now. <laughs> yep. Thank you yep. very much. Oh, no, it, so, that, yeah. Listening to that progression from that little girl who created that little sanctuary in the house to the preteen teenager who really got involved in high school as a way to separate and then going to college, which is the, the big, big transition. Yeah. All, I remember all, going to, yeah. the, I remember yeah. going to the airport and I was just so excited and I was walking down to get on the plane and I turned around to wave at my mom and she was just sobbing her little heart mm -hmm. out. And I'm like, I just was like, aren't you excited for me? <laughs> Poor thing. But um, yeah, and I fell in love with Texas. I just absolutely fell in love with it. Um, mm. Primarily because I'm not a fan of Old Van Winter. So uh, my yeah. first Thanksgiving there, it was 87 degrees and people were sunbathing between the dorms. And I'm like, I have arrived. <laughs> You're home. <laughs> I am home. <laughs> so I lived there for a long time after college. Okay. Who were some of your early, when you think back, some of those early people in your life that you looked up to that were inspiration for you? Mm -hmm. I remember having a couple of very special teachers. Um, my mom said my fourth grade teacher really, really lit a fire under me in, in one way or another and got mm -hmm. me a little more um, involved in doing more outgoing kind of things, I guess. And my 4-H leader, truly, um, when I was a young teen, I started to see um, that my mom had her hands full 
with a with a wonderful man who was kind and generous and talented and all kinds of good things that he just didn't believe about himself. Mm-hmm. And so that's when we started to realize that, oh, this is more than partying. There's something more going on here. Right. And she had her hands full and my 4-H leader ended up being like a second mom to me. And I would spend lots of time at their house. Her, um, her daughter became my best friend and we would mm-hmm. spend time at each other's homes. And what I noticed was that when I was in their home with her brothers, um, it was companionable and fun without an undercurrent. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, so her name was Joy and mm-hmm. she, uh, for years until she passed away um, just a couple of years ago, was just always very special to me. And my, her daughter, Andrea, and I have been friends for decades, literally. That's wonderful. I loved when I, when I find people that I love, I keep them around. So I've still got, yeah, grade school friends and high school and college. And That's um, so she was, and, uh, and both of my grandmothers, actually, um, I, I realized at some point that I was quite lucky that um, I grew up knowing um, all of my grandparents and we spent Sundays together and visited and, and all that. And I knew um, several of my great grandparents, too. And mm. um, yeah, here, this is Georgie. Hi, <laughs> he Georgie. Was part of everything. <laughs> of um, course. So both of my grandmothers, uh, they taught me how to sew. And they were very wise women who, mm. who um, just shared a lot with me. And I think it's funny that um, I had like one proper grandma and one naughty grandma and proper <laughs> grandma <laughs> proper grandma really was oh my gosh she was a beautiful woman and was always so put together and when we stayed the night at her house we we had a schedule there was a time we went to bed and we had a snack at a predetermined time <laughs> yeah, she yeah. breakfast before we went to bed uh, and uh she had a regimen and when i stayed with my other grandmother <laughs> we we uh we drank soda and ate pizza and Cheetos <laughs> and watched Johnny Carson and musicals and westerns until the wee hours of the morning. <laughs> it was so decadent. And it was amazing because I needed both, right? Yeah, I needed, yeah. There were times when being with proper grandma was was very comforting and it there was mm-hmm. routine and it felt safe. And then yeah. we got to go just kind of play <laughs> yeah. with my grandma Walker. Uh, so yeah, did they... I think my family my grandpa too um mm. was a very strong influence on me he was a very wise and gentle man and he was an avid reader and mm. I remember when I got to be 13 or 14 maybe he would just share the books that he was reading with me so we kind of had books wow. that went around and I remember getting a James Michener book from him once and and reading it, I'm like, oh my gosh, grandpa thinks I'm pretty grown up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, it was like sex and drugs and rock and roll. But then along the way in the story, people started to have consequences for various things that were going on in their life. And I'm like, yeah, grandpa, he knows what he's doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess my family was obviously a big influence on me. That's wonderful. Yeah. Yep. So then you went to college. What did you <laughs> major in? Journalism. I, uh, uh, my love of reading and storytelling, all of that really worked together. And uh, in high school, I was on the yearbook staff. And when I went to college, I was the magazine editor and on the newspaper for a little bit. It was just all part of that um, being curious about people and things and yeah. uh, putting it together in some kind of a way. Yeah. And uh, so I, that's what I did at school. And then I kind of floundered for a little bit because um, I remember my senior year, I knew how to do school. I didn't know mm. how to be a grown up. And Life. so that transition right, yeah. right there was um, overwhelming for me because I just, I just didn't know what to do. I can write a paper. I can write a story. I can take this test, but I don't know how to do this other stuff. Right. But, um, but I eventually found my way to textbook publishing. So I still get to do, learn new things and read things sometimes for second graders and sometimes for college kids. But um, yeah, so that's, that's what cool. I still do. Even while I've been the director of the recovery center, I've been doing that too. You've been doing that, right. 
How did you find that company? How did that work out? Uh, which, the textbooks? Yeah. Oh, um, well, actually, my first real big job that I think of as my publishing college was for um, a small uh, publishing firm that produced uh, tax and accounting manuals for solo and small practitioners. Wow. And it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't real glamorous, exciting stuff to read, but it was such an amazing company and group of people. And their hallmark was to provide uh, practical how-to guidance mm. for practitioners. So if you're, uh, if you're at the IRS, if you're somewhere in a hearing or whatever, you want to be able to pick up this book and go to this paragraph and read in one or two sentences what you need to know. And so we would start with like page long paragraphs and, and you know, you're an editor, slice it down into something that is uh, meaningful to somebody who's not at the IRS or the right. AICPA or whatever. And so I learned a lot about language and editing and how to put together things in, in a very detailed way. Hmm. And um, yeah, and I, I learned, I started out probably as a proofreader and then a copy editor and and then became a managing editor and stuff kind of along the way. Just Amazing. Um, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And at some point you decided to cash your sun chips in and go yeah. from Texas back to Vermont in the yep. Northeast. <clears throat> I still can't believe I'm this far north again, <laughs> but here I am. Yes, I was, uh, yeah, I lived in Texas for a while. And, um, and one thing I did when I didn't know how to be a grown up was um, I got married. <laughs> I, thought, I thought that would be the answer. And he was mm -hmm. a wonderful person, kind of looked good on paper and all that. But um, that ended. And right before um, I was in textbook publishing at that time, and all of the publishing companies were gobbling each other up. Mm -hmm. And so the company I was working for, um, was part of one merger or another. And I could have, re my cat is re wreaking havoc. I could have uh, relocated to uh, Southern California, Columbus, I think, or Boston. And so there was a lot going on in my family at the time. So I thought, well, maybe this mm. is the universe telling me I need to be a little closer to home. And so I chose Boston. And I love visiting Boston. I did not like living there. Right. You know, I yeah. would have to uh, get on the bus and go to the subway and, you know, spending two and a half hours a day just getting to and from places didn't appeal to me. But mm -hmm. it was a pretty, a relatively reasonable drive to central New York to see my family. And, right. um, you know, I got to be, it used to be that I'd come home once or twice a year and it would be like I was a visiting dignitary. And during that time when I was around more, at some point, I just became a member of the family. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, is Sue home this weekend? I didn't know she was coming. So it was just like <laughs> I was part of again. Yeah. And during that time, my, you know, I was glad I got to be home. My grandfather uh, got quite ill and, and passed away. So I got to be there for my grandma and my mom. Important. My mom's an only child. So um, mm -hmm. that was a lot for her. And and also, uh, when I first moved back, uh, my dad didn't have a lot of consequences um, for things. Uh, but right when I moved back, he had uh, gotten a DUI and was under house arrest for a while, which wow. was, it was devastating for him. He'd <clears throat> never had anything like that. Um, so I think mm -hmm. that was part of uh, what made it meaningful for me is that I got to be there uh, certainly for my mom yeah. um, and to, for, for my dad, too, to the extent that, you know, mm -hmm. he would let us. Um, so it was just a very complicated time. And it ended up being much more about family than relocating for my job. And then right. as things kind of settled down. Um, yeah, Boston, I, I was there for about three years, I guess. And I just... Uh, yeah, it's one day it was super stressful at work and I said, I'm going to see what else is out there. And I got on um, a, a textbook uh, website for job postings and there was something in a place called Brattleboro, Vermont. And I'm like, <laughs> what kind of publishing place is up in, in Brattleboro and what is Brattleboro? 
And uh, I sent in my uh, letter and my resume. I got a call the next day. And then I had a phone interview. And then the next Monday, I was up in Brattleboro having an in-person interview. And then they offered me the job before I left. And I'm like, well, this is all happening kind of fast. <laughs> and then I'm driving back and they're calling to give me more information. And when all was said and done, yeah, I started to uh, work for a company up here called Stratford Publishing Services that exists under a different name now. But um, yeah, I, I was working in Boston three days and I would come up two days and over wow. like six weeks, I, ended, I then relocated and then was living in Brattleboro and working at this place and wondering how I got this far north again and how cold the winters were going to be. But um, I, and I thought, you know, maybe I was just kind of passing through because yeah, this is way north. <laughs> I still haven't accepted it. Um, but uh, Brattleboro is just this artsy, fartsy, quirky little corner of the world. And I just fell in love with it over time. Oh, and, that's and I've been here, um, what, 16 years now. Wow, that's, that's wonderful. Crazy. Yeah, yeah, it's just crazy. Huh. Yeah. So, yeah, I worked for that company for a couple of years. And, and yeah, there was more mergers. And it was just very stressful. And, and I uh, left that. And for a while, um, I went back to the company in Boston. But I lived in Brattleboro. And I would just go down once or twice oh, I a week. See. Yep. And that was working pretty well. And meantime, in Brattleboro, there's a new uh, place called the Turning Point of Wyndham County, and it's a recovery center. And I'll, I'll talk about this in a minute, but I'm a person in long-term recovery myself, and that means I haven't had a drink in uh, almost 24 years. Wow. And so Fantastic. I was part of a recovery community here, and um, one of my friends was the first volunteer coordinator at Turning Point. And he kept saying, you've got a flexible schedule. You should come down and, and volunteer. And he was just relentless. And so I did. And then the first day I was at the center uh, volunteering, I met the uh, person who was the board chair at the time. And there was some stuff going on. It was a very new center. And they mm. uh, were looking at ways. Anyway, I had experience with budgeting and management and some things, and his eyes kept getting bigger and bigger. And said, <laughs> Would you come to a board meeting? And I said, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and then I ended up being the secretary, and um, it just a uh, very, my oh. whole time at Turning Point has been one coincidence after another, and just kind yeah. of following where life leads. And oh. um, by the fall, uh, the first director had left. And then we as a board tried to decide, okay, does Brattleboro really want this place? Can we make this happen? Mm -hmm. And we ran it as a board um, and tried to figure things out for a few months. Mm -hmm. And we were very behind. We, we had a lot of, we had to get our house in order. And uh, one day the uh, landlord, some guy out in California called and he said, I see you all are struggling what if I cut your rent in half for the next six months to give you a chance to get on your feet? What do you think? And I'm like, yes, please. And yeah. um, so at that point, it seemed like we could make something happen, happen. And I agreed to be the interim director. And yeah, that was 13 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> because it's just kind of like that one one yeah. opportunity after another. And sometimes it was like opportunity, calamity, opportunity, calamity, but <laughs> um, mostly the opportunities and the little miracles and the wonderful, wonderful people along the way. I've gotten to be part of a recovery movement at a time when recovery generally is, has gone through some pretty significant transformation, exciting ones. Absolutely. And here in Vermont, it's been very special. And I just got to be part of it when it was happening, when recovery coaching was new and when um, the network was uh, maybe seven centers when, when I joined. And it's now a mm. network of 12 or a, there are 12 centers in the state. So, right. yeah, that's kind of how I landed in um, so, at Turning Point of Wyndham County. <clears throat> There's three things I want you to talk about around 
your work there, but I also want to go back to your dad for a second. Mm-hmm. Did did he ever get to a place of recovery himself? We um, had an intervention for him when I was still in Texas, actually, and um, it changed things. And he was uh, he didn't drink for I think maybe four months, but he, he mom came home from work one day and and he said, "Okay, we need to talk." I never had anything like what people say a bottom is. I don't, I didn't know what people were talking about most of the time, Mm -hmm. but what I know is that it changed us. We had the intervention and is a process where you each read a letter that you've prepared for and you say how things, his behavior affects you. And then uh, the idea was that if he was at the end, if he heard all that and said, okay, I hear you. And I will go to treatment that was all lined up and everything. And if not, then you would read a second letter and say, okay, if you're not willing to do that, then here are the things that will change. Mm. And we actually had to read the second letter. And then Mm. he said, well, all right, okay, um, Mm. I'll go. And so what I know after that, um, even when he started to drink again, it was different. It was very different. He wasn't as um, depressed and uh, it was just different. The dynamic was different. And, uh, you know, I have people in my family who've been in recovery now for decades. Before I even knew what recovery was, my mom was in recovery. Mm. And I I remember uh, when it happened, even though I didn't know it at the time. Yeah. Because um, my dad was a farmer. And so he would have to milk the cows in the afternoon. And a lot of times he would go out, um, he would go out afterwards, you know, I have to go pick up parts or I have to go, you know, do this or that. And mom would call around to his favorite places to see when he was coming home for dinner. Mm. Uh, I feel a little bad talking about him. I love my dad so much. I know it it comes through, believe me, for both parents. I can, yes. Yeah. So uh, she would do that and, you know, we would eat whenever he got home, maybe 7.30 or 8 o'clock. And she did that. And then one night she called us down for dinner and we're like, dad's not home. And she said, your father knows what time dinner is. (laughs) (laughs) And we're eating dinner. And I was, I was a snarky little kid. It was like mom grew a backbone overnight and I didn't understand what was happening, but she had started to go to Al-Anon. And so it's kind of, she stopped kind of uh, trying to fix things and stopped, she stopped orbiting around the person who was in pain, you know, and tried to just uh, reset things. And so that, and then when we did the intervention, it just changed the rhythm. It changed the way we were reacting to things. Yeah. And um, yeah. Important moments there. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah. So let's go back to the turning point. Mm -hmm. There's three things that um, that come to mind when I think of your 13 years or so in in the job. Um, Mm -hmm. It's hard to imagine 13 years, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But Mm -hmm. so there's there's the new building. There's the focus on training that you have Mm -hmm. had for a long time to make sure that your staff and others are the best they could be in the work. Mm-hmm. And then there's your role as the, you were the president of all the recovery centers for a number of mm-hmm. years as well. So mm-hmm. you went from that incidental happening into this <laughs> one down in Wyndham to mm-hmm. really being the leader of all of them. Tell, talk about yeah, that a little bit. Sure. Um, you know, I think it's how I, um, it's how I learn things. I just kind of immersed myself. (laughs) So when I became the interim director, I didn't know what the network was. I didn't know what ADAP was. I I had a lot of transferable skills from uh, publishing, but I didn't know anything about working with a board. I didn't know anything about fundraising and, and the advocacy was all very new to me. So I just started to go to all the meetings and, um, and I was asked to be the secretary and I thought, well, I would, I would have to take notes and I would have to understand what I was writing about. So 
Um, I attended the meetings and I got to know the people at the state and how the funding worked and the other recovery centers and how we interact with the uh, treatment provider system and hospitals. And, um, you know, honestly, for the first, I don't know, two or three years or more, I, uh, I wasn't as emotionally connected to the work. It was more like, um, okay, this isn't who I am. This isn't what I do. I'm over here in the passing lane. I'm just kind of doing this thing for a while. And somewhere yep. along the way, I got really captivated by mm -hmm. what was happening. Um, because as I said, it was just a very pivotal time in what was happening with recovery and what was happening with um, <clears throat> helping people with substance use disorder who have a medical issue, but who are being um, stigmatized and, and not supported in the ways that were helpful. So mm -hmm. yeah, so I... Um, I became secretary and just as I was around more and doing things and, you know, one year, uh, I think it was 2011 or 12, um, when we were electing officers, I became, well, <laughs> my cats are going crazy. Um, I became the uh, president and, and that was a whole different, um, it was interesting. It was really uh, a learning experience for me although it was a little too much politics, but I, I did get to see some of the work, some more of the backroom stuff and to understand how all the pieces and parts fit together and um, to learn also ways from other states somehow through grants mm -hmm. and things like that. So it was just um, a way to kind of keep learning more. And I love, um, I love all my recovery center director colleagues that, that we can each, we can do together what it, we individually as small recovery centers just couldn't do alone. Yep. And so we collaborated on developing recovery coaching programs and uh, you know, seeking grants together that is, as a community of centers, we could, um, we could attract, but we probably yep. couldn't attract on our own. So yep. yeah, I just, uh, kind of came along for the ride and, and kept following where my interest was taking me. Mm -hmm. And, um, and a lot of that was training because, um, it's such complicated work and you need so many supports. And, um, even when we use volunteers, we want to be sure that they are informed enough, um, that they can, uh, support people and also keep themselves safe as well, safe in the, sense that um, compassion fatigue, secondary stress, those things can really pack a wallop, you know, when yeah. you care so much about what you're doing. And sometimes you're just so frustrated by the complexities of the system or the lack of services mm -hmm. and that we lose people. We lose people too often. And when there are people that you've supported or maybe people that you grew up with because we live in a very small town, Yep. Um, it can really take a toll. So I've just always felt that it was important to provide mm. that kind of support for, for our team and to talk about, uh, we started a, a, a new training maybe six or eight months ago. We've lost a lot of people during this pandemic time and it's been hard on our staff. And so we have a training about um, grief. How do you handle grief mm. in your role when it just is sometimes so heartbreaking and so relentless and you feel so powerless. Yes. So, wow. um, that's wonderful. Yeah. So that's, yeah. that's kind of how that happened. Yeah. Well, that's great. And then, uh, the building tell, tell, Oh yeah. <clears throat> tell yes. us about the building. Yes. That was more, <clears throat> more, lots of serendipity in, in my turning point stories. Um, Let's see. So yes, that that landlord had called and said, "Hey, if I cut your rent in half, <laughs> maybe that would help." <laughs> and so it did. It helped. But then we did decide to move out of downtown. We were paying eighteen hundred dollars a month in rent, which was just insane for the funding we had at the time. <clears throat> so uh, we moved outside of downtown, um, a little too far. Even though we were on the bus line and we were close to some key places. It was a little too far and we knew that almost immediately. Mm -hmm. And um, so it was interesting that it was unfortunate that we had to move, but it also attracted a lot of attention because people started to say, 
we need to find a way to get you all back downtown. Uh, and, yeah. and so after a year and a half or so, I had um, somebody, a, a person recovery come and say, hey, why don't you form a relocation task force? Here's something I did somewhere else. And so I, that meant that the staff would keep doing what they're doing. I would, the board would keep doing what they're doing, but there would be a task force of people who were just gonna be on the lookout for possible buildings or places to build or grant funding or whatever. They would do that and then we would meet regularly and they would come back to us with results. Mm -hmm. And um, this one building, in the meantime, there's been Tropical Storm Irene that happened in, I don't remember when that happened, but. 2012. <laughs> Was it? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, we actually moved the day before the storm. We moved out of downtown the day before the storm. And, mm. and it was a beautiful day. And I thought, oh, this is going to be a big nothing. And then the next day, some of the pictures I saw were from right outside our center, looking down on Flat Street, where it was flooded. Wow. And the, the house where we're in now is on that corner. And we got it at auction in foreclosure because it was right there in, in that 100 year um, floodplain area. Right. So that's wow. how it kept showing up. Um, the, the task force people kept saying, yeah, this one, it's kind of going to need some work. It's, I don't know, <laughs> but it kept coming around. And uh -huh. one, of the, one of the task force members in particular just kind of kept stopping by and then met the people. And anyway, we got very involved with it. And then when it went, um, it went up for auction, we ended up, we had done enough work at that point that we ended up uh, getting it for $76,000. Oh my goodness. And then we spent a fortune fixing it up. <laughs> right. It's gorgeous. Yeah. It's beautiful it. building. It's bright and sunny. And I don't, it's as if I don't remember ever being any place else. It's like, yep. it felt like home and that we're right there in the heart of downtown and that recovery is visible and right. um, just part of the community. And, and we've, um, we have beautiful gardens in the spring and, you know, it's just part of, we feel very much part of the community and the, mm. the neighborhood really embraces us. We never had any of the not in my backyard stuff. Right. Never. It speaks well of Brattleboro. Yeah. And the yeah. work you guys do. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, well, so what's Susie Walker's life outside of her work? What do you love to do? What are your passions, avocations? Um, well, I mentioned that I've been sewing since I was a little kid. And um, mm -hmm. during the pandemic, um, early on, I was making face masks. I was like, I have a sewing machine, I can do something to help. Wow. And then I started to get a lot of different pretty fabrics, because it's kind of monotonous to just, just make these little <laughs> face masks over and over. <laughs> and my Zoom is helping me out. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, so at some point, I had this the stash of fabric and I said geez maybe I'll make a quilt which I'd never done before mm. and so during the pandemic um I became a quilter so I made wow. my first quilt out of all the the remnants that I had from the face masks and I actually included several face masks in the quilt itself wow it makes, makes me giggle but so yeah I did that and then I I became just one of these crazy quilting people that I can't seem to get enough fabric. And I think I've got five or six projects here going right now um, because it's just become that thing about uh, taking the, the colors and the patterns and the different things and putting them together for whatever, a gift or a, yeah. a project yeah. of some kind. So, and I'm, um, my friends are also very dear to me and I've got a group of, uh, gal pals from college and um we've got a social media chat going all the time and we shared wonderful. the last few months um so, several of my friends have lost parents or, or dear mm. ones and so we share things like that we share silly things we and mm. we share the love of quilting mm. and that's so, wonderful we get together for the last, I think, 15 years. We've gotten together once a year. Uh, we each took a turn hosting. So they were in Brattleboro one year. And um, it's just our time to come together and reconnect with each other. 
And this past year, when we got together, we said, let's do kind of like a quilting retreat. Not entirely the whole time, but we right. picked our, our colors from school, purple and white. And we all were tasked with designing um, four blocks that we had to make seven of each. Mm -hmm. And then we, we brought them to Texas and had like a, a block swap. And now we're all, we started out with the plan of having six, eight or 10 inch squares. And in true gal pal fashion, we ended up with everything from six inches to 18 inches. <laughs> so now you've got like 30 some odd blocks. And it's like, how do you put that together into something that makes sense? So we all are, and it's been really fun seeing all that happen. So yeah, my friends are dear to me. I like to travel and visit people and yeah, certainly my sewing and um, things like that and to be involved in the community in different ways. That's wonderful. Yeah, still read a lot, still. Uh, yeah. You got your two um, cats over there. my cats, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wreaking havoc while I'm talking to you. <laughs> Do you have, are there any, um, favorite quotes that you have about life or, or wisdoms that you'd like to share to, for others to benefit from? Sure. Well, I always, um, I have lots of, I'm not wearing them today. I have lots of uh, things that have to do with light. I, I really believe that we all have like a celestial spark inside of us somewhere and that um, I'm drawn to things like that. But I did find this, um, I had to have it in front of me, but um, Ever since happiness heard your name, it has been running through the streets trying to find you. Mm. I just love that. I just mm. love that. That's and wonderful. Marianne Williamson, how she talks about um, that it's not the darkness we most fear, but it's the light that we're um, that we sometimes don't realize our own radiance, wow. and that we fear the dark when um, we think we fear the dark, but it's really being you know, our most radiant selves that fear, fear. that overwhelms us, I guess. Yes. Wow. Beautiful. Hmm. Huh. So what's next? Do you have a next after? Mm -hmm. uh... Yeah, I'm in the middle of it um, in that um, I had decided that it was time to leave Turning Point after these years. Um, it was just time. Mm -hmm. And so uh since October, well, before that, I guess, we've had a hiring committee and they've been working on interviewing people and, and doing all of that. So I'm in the process of transitioning out and following in the fine footsteps of people like you who uh, transitioned out, but did so with like an onboarding period to help the new person. Because it's such a complicated, un unusual job. I can't imagine yeah. doing it any other way, even though you and I probably both did just, just here's your office. Good luck to you. <laughs> that's right. Um, so um, that's the plan is we'll find somebody and I'll spend, I don't even know, two or three or four months being around right. less and less over time. Yep. And yep. so we've been really working with the team and, you know, the staff to make sure they feel supported and part of, and that's really important. And we're using it as an opportunity to look at our, our values and our mission, because mm. like a lot of places, the pandemic has, has changed the way we do business. Yeah. And so we're trying to react to that. Um, but I've been doing my editing throughout my tenure at Turning Point. Mm. And so I've just now shifted the balance back to being um, more editing yeah. and reducing my hours at Turning Point. Yeah. Um, while I support the team and I'm just, I just noticed that I've been delegating more. I feel more like a consultant in some ways mm -hmm. that I'm there mm -hmm. to help them through this transition. Mm -hmm. And yet my day-to-day -day role at the center is already different, yeah. which is, I guess, natural as I'm moving out. Yes. Um, I yes. keep feeling myself shift in different ways. Like I went through a pretty big one a couple of weeks ago. It's like, Oh, you know how like when you're walking yep. over a puddle, you've got yep. one foot here and one foot here. And then all of a sudden you're all the way on one side. Yeah. I suddenly just felt like, oh, wow, I'm all the way on the other side now. <laughs> um, so but it's like with all the things that I'm involved in is the people that are the most special to me. So I keep assuring them I'm yes. not 
I'll That's still right. be here. And I collect people. I've still got a great school friend in my back. <laughs> yes, you do collect people. And that, that a lot of who you are today is that collection of all those yeah. friends and family. Yeah. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's as, the plan. Okay. That's a great plan, Susie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So as, as we kind of wrap up our time together on this interview, mm -hmm. is there anything you want to say or any part of your life that you want to mm -hmm. uh, give attention to before we close for the day? Oh my goodness. That's a big question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm just, I'm, I, I have a very grateful heart. And, and for me, a, a big part of that is being a person of recovery. And so I'm glad I got to learn more about that as a person and to just know how big recovery is and how different it is for people. Um, and I don't know why this popped into my head, but it did. But I've just learned a lot of um, tools, a lot of life skills along the way, maybe a little bit of wisdom. Mm -hmm. um, from being that scared little girl trying to create my own world to being in the world yeah. and open to it. And um, I guess about a dozen years ago, I learned I was doing this meditation program and it just, it was just maybe the time in my life or something, but it just really clicked in all kinds of ways. And somewhere in that period, I started to wake up every morning to the sound of this song every day. And it was a song I knew from growing up. And um, it's not a song I thought about a lot. I mean, I liked it well enough, but literally every morning I'd wake up and there Rich. it would be. Huh. And, and at first I was like, seriously? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'd be like, oh, hello song. And now I just listen to it. Mm. But it's been there for all these years now. It went silent a couple of times during a period of grief. Mm -hmm. And then I didn't know it was gone till it came back. Mm -hmm. But I don't even know what that means, except that I try to just um, have a sense of wonder. Yeah, yeah. Have a sense of wonder and connection yeah. and to just really um, cherish those seemingly little things, quirky things, um, and all the amazing people around me to mm -hmm. really see the light in them. Um, mm -hmm. because we all have one and I, maybe that's a part of the work at turning point is that there are so many people that, uh, have gone dark out of pain and, and, and turmoil and, and other things. And so if the little bit we can do is to help people see their own light, um, I think yeah. that's why I've stuck around as long as I have. That's well said. I think, uh, you've turned the light on for thousands of people. Not only in Wyndham County, but across the state. Um, thank you. Thank what's you, Gary. The, what's the name of the song? I I have told music is so personal. I I okay. told my mom, and she's like, oh, hmm. So uh, <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll leave it there. Song. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we'll leave it there. Well, okay. thank you for the time today. You've had a, you. an amazing life, and we've all benefited from it. Um, mm -hmm. And I know that. All that you have done will continue. And uh, I look forward to that. Thanks, Gary.